This is now the third in a three-part video series on the fundamental theorem of calculus. So you should go back and look at the previous installments if you haven't already done so. And here we're going to revisit part one of the fundamental theorem with some examples. But before that, it's high time we introduced some of the basic terminology that we use with integrals. An integral looks something like this. It's got bookends, which are the integral sign in front. I've called it curly S before. Most people just call it the integral sign. And then on the other end, the differential. We've got two limits of integration for a definite integral. And we have the upper limit and the lower limit of integration. We don't want to call in the left and right limit because they might not be left and right in that order. We integrate, however, from the lower limit to the upper limit from A to B. And the integrand is the thing in the middle that we're integrating. Well, it's usually in the middle. I mean, something like uh, dt over t would have 1 over t as the integrand. But most of the time, the integrand looks just like this in the middle. Now, when we integrate, we have a variable that we're integrating with respect to, and that's indicated by the differential. It's the variable of integration. It's called a dummy variable. Because if you change the name for the dummy variable, you don't change the integral. I've mentioned this fact before. For example, if a function is positive, the integral is just the area under the curve. Now, if you rename the independent variable, that just changes, what, the label on the horizontal axis? Well, that's not going to change the area. The integral only depends on the function you're integrating and the limits of integration. This comes, in fact, from what happens with Riemann sums, and there again, you change the name of the variable, the independent variable, you don't change the Riemann sum, and when you take the limit, the resulting integral is also independent of what name you use for the independent variable. Here, to remind you, is the statement of part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the theorem tells us how to take the derivative of this kind of an integral with an upper limit of x. You take the derivative with respect to x. The lower limit, a, is fixed. The statement of the theorem is that to find the derivative, you just substitute the independent variable into the integrand. Ignore the lower limit. So as an example, let's look at this shaded region. It's expressed as the integral of sine t from pi over 2 to x. So the answer depends on what x you choose, of course. And then you can take the derivative of that quantity with respect to x. And the theorem tells us you just substitute x in for t and you get sine x. And we're saying that for small changes in x, the corresponding small changes in area, shown by this vertical strip, which I've shaded green, are these uh, changes are very nearly proportional to the change in x. And the ratio of those small changes is just sine x. That's the, ratio, the rate of change of area with respect to x. Most students are more familiar with part 2 of the theorem than part 1. So there's a tendency to see students answer the problem using part 2 if they can. This way of thinking suggests that, well, you first evaluate the integral and then take the derivative of that. It seems reasonable. Okay, so in this case, if you integrate first, use an antiderivative of minus cosine t and evaluate between the two limits of integration, and then simplify, you just get minus cos x. Now you need to take the derivative of that. Take the derivative of minus cos x. You get sine x, which is the same answer as before. However, this approach is really a lot more work, isn't it? And not only that, this idea doesn't always work. <laughs> 
as I'll show you in this example. So here you're going to have a hard time trying to work out the integral itself. But uh, the derivative of the integral, that's what you're really being asked for in the fundamental theorem. Part 1 tells you just substitute an x, you get sine of x squared. Pretty straightforward. If you were to look for an antiderivative or an explicit evaluation of this integral, then you're going to come up short. Try as you may. You're not going to find anything uh, that works. There's no explicit formula as one of these cases where you're gonna, just not going to be able to find something that works. And examples like this are popular in textbooks because they force the student to use part one of the fundamental theorem and not look for a roundabout way. Here is a slightly different tricky type of example you'll find in textbooks in homework. And the answer of course is zero because the integral from 3 to 7, both limits are constant, and so the integral is just a number, it's a constant, and the derivative of a constant is zero. So don't be fooled. Now this one is different because while the upper limit is constant, the lower limit is x. So the limit in this case is the negative of e to the x squared. And the reason for that negative is that when you switch the limits of integration, a minus sign comes out of the integral, as we've discussed on a previous video. And then applying the fundamental theorem, part one, you just get minus e to the x squared for the answer. Here we have the upper limit is variable, but it's not a simple x in the upper limit. The answer comes out perhaps not quite what you might at first think. There's this extra 14x in front, and it's there because of the chain rule. So it's not clear how the chain rule comes about here. Let's break it down this way. Let u be the upper limit, 7x squared. And then our integral, I'll call it y, is the integral from 3 to u. Now we're asked for the derivative of the integral with respect to x. That's dy by dx, which by the chain rule is dy by du times du by dx. The first what, derivative, dy by du, is e to the u squared. And then you multiply by du by dx. So there's the 14x. And of course, you also have to replace u by uh, 7x squared and then write the answer in terms of x, which gives our final answer for the required derivative. Now, let's put together all the techniques we've talked about in the previous examples, and this one's got it all. Both limits are functions of x. So let's write u for the lower limit, v for the upper limit, the integral, I'll call it y. Now, I can split up y into two separate integrals this way. This comes from our identity that says integral from 0 to u plus the integral from u to v equals the integral from 0 to v. And then just rewrite that a bit, and that gives us a way to split up the original integral, y, as a difference of two separate integrals, and I'll call those y1 and y2. And we're being asked for the derivative of the integral that was given. That's dy by dx, and that is therefore dy1 by dx minus dy2 by dx. And each of those derivatives, I apply the chain rule as before. And the first one is involving v, and the second one is involving u, and it's just like example 5 in each case. And then, you know, to go back and write everything in terms of x, and this is our final answer. The general pattern for what we did in example 6, 
I can describe by this formula. So if you're comfortable with the work we did in the previous example, you should have no trouble checking this rule. However, I don't really recommend memorizing a formula like this. You're better off learning the more basic rules like chain rule and how to split up an integral into separate integrals over subintervals. And then just practice using those steps in the examples you work through. At least I would never try to memorize a formula like this. I just work it out when I need it. So here is an example which almost fits that pattern, but you know, if you ever encounter something like this, you realize it doesn't quite work. Not only are the limits of integration dependent on x, but the integrand also depends on x. And you might wonder how to do something like this if you ever see it. And you would be right in guessing that, yes, there needs to be a term that depends on the changes in upper limit, and there needs to be a term dependent on changes in the lower limit of integration, just like the formula above. But there has to be something more because of changes in the integrand itself. And there's such a formula, but I'm not going to discuss it further here because the right place to talk about this is in uh, probably third semester of calculus where you get into partial derivatives and you'll have the right language and tools to discuss this kind of thing. But for the time being, it's a good uh, example to look at and see, oh, we've got an x and a t in the integrand. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, x and t, they're not the same thing, are they? Well, no, of course they're not. Uh, you need to be reminded. Um, some students tend to think x and t are really the same thing. Uh, they're not. So in the statement of the theorem above, you'll see that we're integrating on an interval from a to x, and x is the right endpoint, but t varies all the way between a and x. So t takes on all the values between a and x. So clearly, there's a difference between t and x. And in the last example at the bottom here, it's an even bigger difference because t is varying from 2x to x squared. That interval doesn't even probably contain x, at least most of the time. Mm -hmm.